Hey, Trekkies and Trekkers and all science fiction lovers alike, uh, Bartell's Bookshelf here with my uh, third Star Trek unboxing video. Um, I mentioned in my previous video I had two more bu uh, big uh, lots coming in from eBay, and um, both of them just arrived uh, today, so I'm going to do two separate videos for these. And uh, we're starting with uh, this big boy here. I think this has like 36 books in it. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's just, let's get into this. This is going to be a long video, so pull up a chair, get a drink. Uh, I hope you find this interesting, and uh, let's go. This box has seen better days. <laughs> Oops, styrofoam. <laughs> All right, uh, let's get into this. So, yeah, here we have... Uh, Next Generation number 7, Masks by John Vornold. It's a pretty neat cover. Uh, the Enterprise journeys to Lorca, a beautiful world with a feudal culture where the inhabitants wear masks to show their rank and station. There, Captain Picard and an away team don masks of their own to begin a quest for the planet's ruler and the great wisdom mask that the leader traditionally wears, their mission to establish diplomatic relations. But shortly after transporting, Picard and his party lose contact with the ship, and Commander Riker leads a search party down, the plan down to the planet to find them. Both men, however, are unaware that their searches, indeed the ship's entire mission, are part of a madman's plan. A madman who is setting the stage for a trap that will ensnare both Enterprise landing parties and leave him poised to seize control of the awesome wisdom mask and the planet Lorca itself. That sounds pretty interesting. I love uh, stuff involving, like, masks, people wearing masks, that kind of thing. So that, that sounds really cool. These are all really nice uh, condition as well, I'm surprised. So yeah, there's masks. This is a duplicate, uh, number 24, Nightshade, by Laurel K. Hamilton. I already uh, talked about this in a, in a previous video, so... Uh, next we have number 14, Exiles. That's also a, a duplicate, so I talked about that in my previous uh, one of my previous hauls. Next we have number 17, Boogeyman, by Mel Gilden. We have uh, number 15, Fortune's Light, by Michael Jan Friedman. That's a duplicate. I talked about that in one of my previous hauls. Next we have Star Trek The Next Generation, The Genesis Wave, Book 1, by John Vornolt. Intended to create life from nothingness, the Genesis device had the potential to become a weapon of awe-inspiring destructiveness, capable of rearranging matter and life energy on a planetary scale. After the cataclysmic explosion of the Genesis planet and the Klingon Empire's attempt to steal the top-secret technology, Starfleet wisely decided to destroy all data and records on Project Genesis, hoping to bury its deadly secrets forever. But now a mysterious wave of energy is sweeping across the Alpha Quadrant, transforming matter on a molecular level to create bizarre new landscapes and life forms. Billions of living beings and hundreds of inhabited worlds lie in the path of the mutagenic wave, which is expanding outward toward Earth. To discover the origins of the wave, Captain Picard and his crew must probe long buried mysteries. But even if he can uncover the shocking history of the Genesis wave, is there any way to save the future from its unleashed fury? That sounds fun, following up on the uh, the Genesis storyline from some of the old Star Trek movies. See how that turns out. Mutagenic Waves. Sounds entertaining. See, next we have uh, The Eyes of the Beholders by A.C. Crispin. This is another duplicate. I talked about this in one of my previous hauls, so there you go. Uh, these ones I'm really excited to get to. So this is uh, Star Trek New Frontier, uh, book one by Peter David. Um, this is a part of a, a very famous uh, series of Star Trek novels about a completely new crew um, that was created just for the novels. It was the, I believe, it was the first like totally original Star Trek uh, novel series created about a captain named Mackenzie Calhoun, who's the the, the, the captain of the USS Excalibur. Um, this is a very popular series. Uh, I've heard a lot of good things about it, so I'm very eager uh, to get into it. Let's see, next we have number 12 of Next Generation, Doomsday World, by Carmen Carter, Peter David, Michael Jan Friedman, and Robert Greenberger. That's a lot of writers. The planet Kirlos, an artificial world built by a mysterious, long-dead race called the Ariantu. Kirlos is now home to many races from both the Federation and the Kavin hegemony, who have enjoyed years of peaceful coexistence and profitable trade. The planet also holds a wealth of undiscovered archaeological treasures, which the Enterprise and its crew are dispatched to help discover. Sent to the surface to assist an archaeological team, Geordi, Data, and Worf soon find themselves cut off from the Enterprise and the prime suspects in a series of terrorist attacks. The three Enterprise crewmen are imprisoned, relations between the Kevin and the Federation begin to crumble, and Kirlos's ancient underground machinery awakens from a centuries-long dormancy, primed to release the most powerful destructive force ever known. Sounds like a very, a very Star Trek kind of story with, you know, warring races and ancient computers and things like that. Um, could be interesting, though. We'll see how that is. 
Ah, I'm, re I'm really excited about this one. This is Volume 2 of The Eugenics Wars by Greg Cox, uh, The Rise and Fall of Khan Nunyan Singh. This is, um, I have the first volume already, but this is Volume 2, and the whole, um, it's just all the backstory of Khan, as it says, The Rise and Fall of Khan Nunyan Singh, so going into the eugenics wars, uh, how Khan was like sort of the, the, the lead, the, this big leader, um, this big fascist dictator, essentially, going, and then, um, there's a later book going into his exile, which is uh, the, the period in between Space Seed and The Wrath of Khan. So I'm, I've heard a lot of great things about these books. I'm really interested, uh, really excited to dig into them. Oh, next I have a, uh, an original series book here. I think this is a duplicate, but I haven't talked about this one yet in a video. This is Time Trap by David Dvorkin, number 40. In a remote area of Federation space, the Enterprise picks up an urgent distress signal from a Klingon vessel. Tracing the SOS, the crew finds the Klingon cruiser Mahler trapped in a dimensional storm of unprecedented power. Yet paradoxically, the ship refuses both the Enterprise's call and the offers of help. Determined to discover what the Klingons are doing in Federation space, Kirk beams aboard their ship with a security team, just as the storm flares to its highest intensity. As the bridge crew watches in horror, Mahler vanishes from the Enterprise's view screen, and James T. Kirk awakens 100 years in the future. So that sounds fun, Kirk getting sent into the future. That's interesting because, um, okay, so this is published in 1988, and um, The Next Generation began in 1987, which took place 100 years after the original series. So I'll be interested to see if there's any crossover there in terms of like the continuity or the lore or anything like that. So we'll see. What's going on with Kirk's face in that cover, by the way? <laughs> he looks like he's seen some shit. So yeah, there you go. Now we have uh, The Next Generation number 5, Strike Zone by Peter David. Deep in the uncharted regions of our galaxy, a primitive warlike race, the Creel, have stumbled upon weapons powerful beyond their wildest imaginings. The Creel have used those weapons to attack their most bitter enemies, the Klingons. Now Captain Jean-Luc Picard and the crew of the USS Enterprise have been called in to mediate the dispute. The Enterprise will ferry diplomatic teams from the two warring races to the source of their conflict, the mysterious planet where the weapons were discovered, in an attempt to find a peaceful solution to the conflict and discover the origins of the super-powerful weapons before the entire galaxy erupts into full-scale war. Sounds a little generic, but Peter David seems to be a very well-liked Star Trek writer, so we'll see how that is. This is uh, Trader Winds by L.A. Graff. This is book three in the Lost Years saga, which, as I mentioned before, um, is a series that takes place in between the end of the original series and the first movie. Um, don't know much about it. Um, I have a copy of the Lost Years, um, and I think with some of these boxes, I think I have all of the uh, Lost the Lost Years series, but I'll have to see. So yeah, there you go. That was uh, published under Star Trek number 70. Next, we have Next Generation number 11, Gulliver's Fugitives by Keith Sherry. While searching for the USS Huxley, a starship missing for over 10 years, the Enterprise stumbles across a forgotten colony of humans on a planet called Rampart, a world where fiction, speculation, and works of the imagination are considered the ultimate crime. A survey team for the planet beams on board the Enterprise to search for contraband materials, and suddenly the crew find themselves plunged into the middle of a murderous civil war between a determined band of rebels and the planet's ruthless mind police. A civil war whose outcome will determine not only the future of the planet Rampart, but the life of Captain Jean-Luc Picard as well. That sounds fun. A very like high concept Star Trek kind of thing, a world where fiction and works of the imagination are considered a, a crime, which obviously Star Trek is very much against, so I'll be interested to see how that turns out. So next we have uh, The Next Generation Crossover by Michael Jan Friedman. Continuing the mission he began in Unification, Starfleet Ambassador Spock endeavors to impart the logic of the Vulcan way to a small band of Romulan of Romulans eager to unite the Romulan Empire and the planet Vulcan. But unbeknownst to them, a Romulan spy has joined the ranks disguised as a unification sympathizer. Deceived by this traitor, Spock and his students are taken hostage. Fearful that Spock's knowledge of Federation security will fall to enemy hands, Starfleet dispatches its best ship, the USS Enterprise 1701D, and most respected captain, Jean-Luc Picard, to secure the hostage's release. Spock's former shipmate from the original Enterprise, Ambassador McCoy, over 140 years old but still as feisty as ever, is brought in to consult in the negotiations. Their situation is further complicated when Captain Montgomery Scott confiscates an out-of-service starship and affects his own daring rescue of Spock. Picard must now find a way to preserve the Federation's security and prevent a war while treading a minefield of danger and deadly Romulan politics that threaten his ship, his crew, and the Federation he serves. So really, that says all you need to know. It's a big old crossover book. Spock, Picard, McCoy, and Scott. So that, that could be a lot of fun. We'll see how that turns out. Ah, this is a uh, another duplicate, but uh, this is I haven't shown this in a video yet. So this is uh, Spock's World by Diane Duane. Um, this is literally it's about Spock's world. It's about the planet Vulcan. Uh, I've read a lot about this online. This is one of the the most well loved Star Trek books. I believe it was one of the first books um, that went into detail about the planet Vulcan. 
and there's kind of um, uh, there there's there's like a main story going on in the book, and then in between that, there's like little sort of interstitial bits, kind of exploring the world of Vulcan and their philosophy and things like that. So yeah, I've heard a lot about this. Um, I look very I very much look forward to um, reading that. So next we have Next Generation number three, The Children of Hamelin by Carmen Carter. The Hamelin Massacre. Every Starfleet officer knows the tale. The tiny Federation outpost of Hamelin was destroyed, its entire adult population ruthlessly slaughtered before the first defense shields could be raised. Even worse, the colony's children disappeared without a trace, abducted by the aliens who attacked with a ferocity and speed that outmatched their Starfleet pursuers. Now, fifty years later, the Chirai ships have appeared again, but this time the Federation is ready. This time the Chirai must pay for what they need. The precious metals can only be bought with the Hamlin children still living with their captors. This time the Chirai must face Captain Jean-Luc Picard and the crew of the Starship Enterprise. Cool. Shades of, um, Pied Piper, maybe? We'll see how that turns out. Next I have Star Trek The Next Generation number 2, The Peacekeepers by Jean Deweese. Exploring a deserted alien spaceship, Lieutenant Commander Data and Lieutenant Geordi LaForge... Oh, it spells his name as Georgie on the back here. Georgie LaForge. Suddenly find themselves transported light years away into the middle of a deadly conflict. While Captain Picard and the crew of the Enterprise search f feverishly for the missing crewmen, Data and LaForge discover they are in a station almost identical to the one they were exploring, high in orbit around an Earth-type world. Years before, the occupants of that planet accidentally stumbled onto the ship and its advanced technology, and since then have used its weapons to keep the nations on the planet below disarmed and at peace. Now their own arrival has precipitated a crisis on the station. Somehow, Data and LaForge must find a way to restore trust between the planet below and the station's guardians up above before a final destructive war breaks out. Cool, cool. It's annoying to me that it mentions Data and LaForge, on the, uh, Data and Jordy on the on the back, but they're not on the cover. But Jordy and and Data are one of the best uh, bromances on Next Generation, so that should be a lot of fun. I look forward to reading that eventually. Next, we have Next Generation number nine, A Call to Darkness by Michael Jan Friedman. The Enterprise discovers a lifeless Federation research vessel orbiting a planet hidden behind a mysterious energy shield. Over the strong objections of his senior officers, Captain Picard and an away team beam over in search of the missing crew and vanish. But soon, his captain's disappearance is not the only problem facing Commander Riker, for a mysterious disease has begun ravaging the Enterprise crew. Now Riker must unravel the secrets of the planet below in order to rescue Picard and prevent the starship's destruction. How many Star Trek stories are there where the crew gets infected by a mysterious disease? Hmm. Oh well, we'll see how that turns out. Uh, an another copy of uh, Masks here. Oh, another uh, original series one here. This is number 38, The IDIC Epidemic by Jean Laura. IDIC, infinite diversity and infinite combination. More than just a simple credo. For those of the planet Vulcan, it is the cornerstone of their philosophy. Now, on the Vulcan science colony Nisus, that credo of tolerance is being put to its sternest test. For here, on a planet where Vulcan, human, Klingon, and countless other races live and work side by side, a deadly plague has sprung up. Another one. A plague whose origins are somehow rooted in the concept of IDIC itself. A plague that threatens to tear down that centuries-old maxim and replace it with an even older concept. Interstellar war. Sounds cool. I've always, I've always loved that concept. IDIC, infinite diversity and infinite combinations. That's something we should all live by, I think. Um, so yeah, it'll be very interesting to see that, um, that credo sort of be challenged in this book. So we'll see how that turns out. We've got a copy of um, Vendetta here, the giant novel by Peter David. I talked about that in a previous video, so I won't mention that again here, but there you go. Ah, we have, um, I already own this, um, but I haven't talked about it. So this is a, a copy of Ghost Ship. This is the very first uh, Next Generation novel by Diane Carey. Um, Michael K. Vaughn did a review on this, and he said it wasn't very good, but I'll be interested to see what it's like. Um, one of the things I love about older science fiction um, is that uh, they often uh, end up predicting things that end up being contradicted. So this takes place in, there's a prologue in this that takes place in 1995 where a mysterious creature destroys a Soviet aircraft carrier. Yes, a Soviet aircraft carrier in 1995. So, yeah, we'll see how that turns out. Next we have Next Generation number 8, The Captain's Honor by David and Daniel Dvorkin. A series of vicious attacks by the enigmatic Madoc Empire has devastated the planet Tanara, bringing the Enterprise and another fe Federation starship, the Centurion, to the planet's aid. The Centurion's captain is Lucius Sejanus, a powerful, magnetic man who favors taking a far stronger stance against the Madoc than Captain Picard. And as the conflict escalates, Sejanus' instincts seem to be correct, for it appears only extreme measures can stop the murderous raids on Tanara. 
Now the people of Tenora must decide, must decide which path they will follow, the way of peace or the road to war. But unknown to any, one of the Centurion's offers has made that decision for them, and plans to provoke a full-scale war between the Federation and the Madoc Empire. Sounds cool. I always enjoy stories where sort of two captains butt heads, you know, different differing philosophies, that kind of thing. Star Trek's always really good at that sort of stuff. So yeah, we'll see how that turns out. Next we have Star Trek Ex Machina by Christopher L. Bennett. In the aftermath of the astonishing events of Star Trek The Motion Picture, the captain and officers of the USS Enterprise remain haunted by their encounter with the vast artificial intelligence of V'ger, and by the sacrifice and ascension of their friend and shipmate, Willard Decker. As James T. Kirk, Spock, and Leonard McCoy attempt to cope with the personal fallout of that ordeal, a chapter from their mutual past is reopened, raising troubling new questions about the relationship among God, man, and AI. On the recently settled world of Darren IV, the former refugees of the Fabrini wor world ship Yonata are being divided by conflicting ideologies as those clinging to their theocratic past vie with visionaries of a future governed by reason alone. Now, echoes of the V'ger encounter reverberate among the Enterprise officers who years ago overthrew the Oracle, the machine god that controlled Yonata. Confronting the consequences of those actions, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy also face choices that will decide the fate of a civilization and which may change them forever. Interesting, so it's kind of like a uh, pseudo-sequel to the motion picture. Um, I've heard a lot about this book. Christopher L. Bennett seems to be a very well-liked uh, Star Trek writer, so I'll be interested to see how that turns out. Uh, next, we have. I think I've talked about this in a previous video as well. Uh, this is one that I already own, Unification. This is based on an episode of Next Generation where Picard meets up with uh, Spock. Um, so yeah, this should be uh, interesting. I I'll have to watch the episode and then compare the book and see how they how they go together. Again, I've talked about this in a previous video. This is the novelization of Star Trek VI by J.M. Dillard. Um, I love this movie. It's one of my favorite Star Trek movies, and hopefully the book will be just as good. Uh, an another uh, episode adaptation very similar to Unification. This is Relics uh, by Michael Jan Friedman, based on the television episode by Ron Moore. Um, this is a crossover between, um, obviously, Geordi and Montgomery Scott, um, sort of, you know, the two engineers sort of colliding. Uh, so, yeah, should be should be fun, should be interesting. Look forward to that. I already own this one, but uh, I haven't talked about it on camera. So this is number 75 uh, of, of the original Star Trek series, First Frontier, by Diane Carey and Dr. James I. Kirkland. While testing a new shielding device, the Enterprise is caught in the middle of a Klingon-Romulan battle. When the Enterprise crew rescues a life pod, they are confronted by a Klingon who claims to know nothing of human existence. Convinced the Klingon is telling the truth, Captain Kirk hurries to Starfleet headquarters in search of answers. But upon arriving on Earth, the Starship Enterprise crew finds that Earth is a vast jungle-like paradise where large reptilian animals rule, with no signs of human life anywhere. Now, Kirk must travel to the past in search of... <clears throat> in search of the key to the mystery, or face the destruction of the human race. I mean, really, that says everything you need to know. Star Trek and dinosaurs. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm for it. Let's go. <laughs> uh, we have um, book three of a series uh, that I, I, haven't, I don't have the others, so I'll have to check that out. But this is book three of the Q Continuum by Greg Cox, Q-Zone. Um, from what I understand, this series goes into sort of more of Q's backstory. Um, so uh, I'll have to... Uh, comment more on that once I actually get get the first book in the series. So, but Q is always fun. I always enjoy anything with Q and Picard. They might be the uh, the best bromance in uh, in Next Generation. <laughs> so, so now we have Star Trek num Next Generation number thirty two Requiem by Michael Jan Friedman and Kevin Ryan. There's a Gorn there, so I'm already interested. Twenty five years ago, Captain Jean Luc Picard conducted breakthrough negotiations with an aggressive race called the Gorn. Now, on the anniversary of that achievement, Captain Picard and the Enterprise are headed for the Gorn homeworld to continue that important work. But when the ship stops to investigate a mysterious alien artifact, Captain Picard is suddenly hurled through time and space. Just as Commander Riker and the Starship Enterprise crew begin an impossible search for their captain, the Gorn summit goes terribly wrong. As war looms over the galaxy and Picard is desperately needed on the Gorn homeworld, the captain finds himself stranded in the past on a planet called Cestus III at a crucial turning point in Federation history. Now, caught in a deadly situation that challenges Picard's most cherished beliefs, he must weigh the fate of a world against the future of the entire Federation. Okay, that sounds fucking awesome. <laughs> so, I, I'm, it mentions Cestus III, so I'm guessing this is about um, Picard going back in time to the original encounter with uh, Kirk and the Gorn, uh, trying to sort of... Uh, foment relations between them. That sounds like great. I want to read that. So yeah, I'm really excited to get to that one. Uh, next we have Next Generation number 28, Here There Be Dragons by John Peel. I already talked about this in a previous video, but this involves um, essentially the Next Generation crew being transported to a fantasy world, so I'm very interested in that. Look forward to seeing what that's like. Uh, next we have uh, an original series novel, number 57, The Rift by Peter David. 
Every 33 years, a rift in space connects the Federation with a mysterious race called the Caligar who live on a planet hundreds of light years away, much too far to travel in a starship. Captain Kirk and the Enterprise are dispatched to transport a Federation delegation of diplomats, scholars, and scientists who will travel to Caligar directly during the brief t period of time that the rift will be open. Mr. Spock leads the Federation party as they travel by shuttle through the rift just as the group of the aliens arrive in Federation space. The meetings go smoothly until the Caligar takes Spock's party hostage and Kirk discovers that the aliens Aliens are keeping a deadly secret. With angry Tellarite and Andorian, oh, they spelled Andorian incorrectly, and Dorain fleets ready to attack the Caligar, Kirk must save Spock and the others before war breaks out and the rift closes for another 50 years. That sounds pretty fun. I enjoy stories like that, you know, alien cultures who can only be contacted for short periods of time. There was an episode of Deep Space Nine that was kind of like that with Jedzia Dax that was a lot of fun, so look forward to that. Next we have Sarek. By A.C. Crispin. This is obvious. This, this, yeah, this begins after the events of Star Trek VI. Spock's mother, Amanda Grayson, is dying, and Spock returns to the planet Vulcan where he and Sarek enjoy a rare moment of reproachment. But just as his wife's illness grows worse, duty calls Sarek away, once again sowing the seeds of conflict between father and son. Yet soon Sarek and Spock must put aside their differences and work together to foil a far-reaching plot to destroy the Federation, a plot that Sarek has seen in the making for nearly his entire career. So basically it's, um, it's a big thick Star Trek book that goes into the backstory and sort of more exploring more of the character of Spock's father, Sarek, so I'm really excited to, to check that one out. And A.C. Crispin is a pretty well-regarded writer. Look forward to that. And then, finally, um, again, I already own a copy of this, but I haven't talked about it in a video. This is uh, Time for Yesterday, uh, number 39, Time for Yesterday by A.C. Crispin. This is a sequel to Yesterday's Son, which is uh, about uh, Spock discover uh, going to an alternate dimension where he has a son. And this sequel involves uh, going through the Guardian of Forever, where he meets his son as an adult, and he's like this big buff He-Man looking dude. So um, that just looks a lot of fun. Look forward to checking that one out. And um, yeah, so that is the end of this first uh, Star Trek uh, book haul. Um, I'll probably have the uh, the next one up in a few days here uh, here soon. Um, so until then, I hope you enjoyed. As always, like, comment, and subscribe. Um, and again, if you if you are a fan of Star Trek books, if you have any favorites you want me to check out, please comment below. Let me know. Tell me about them. Um, I want to know. As, I want to explore this whole series as much as I can. So yeah, uh, until I see you guys again, live long and prosper, and uh, have a good day. <laughs>